another edition of Encore Learning Presents. Uh, my name is David Tate, and I'm a member of the Encore Learning Special Events Committee, which works hard to bring you these events as well as the ever popular tours. Uh, we're always looking, always looking for uh, additional volunteers to help out. So if you're interested in uh, joining in on the fun, and it, it can be fun at times, um, but please uh, uh, indicate your interest by sending an email to the main uh, Encore Learning email, which is on, uh, what is that? info at encorelearning.net. That's info at encorelearning.net. So today uh, we have a multifaceted talk, which gives us an um, actually uh, intimate perspective on a budding romance, uh, but also it, it paints a picture of the trials and tribulations of a couple trying to plan their future as World War II draws to a conclusion and also touches um, uh, uh, touches on the history and the culture of the time. So I, I think it's gonna be very interesting. Interesting, But before I introduce uh, our speaker, just a few notes on how to make the most of the technology and participate uh, in the Q and A if, uh, if you want. So, okay, so here, so, um, we, we take questions via the Q&A function, not the chat. Chat's actually uh, disabled, but the Q&A works uh, very much like chat. You just find icon, click it, type in your question, and we'll have the question. Uh, uh, the you, you won't actually see your, your question any, anywhere, but we have it, trust me, and we're gonna answer all the questions at the end. So, but you can put them in at any time whenever they come to mind, and we'll collect them and, and then, uh, um, answer them at the end of the presentation. Also, you can, we have live transcript or closed captions. Uh, this is under your control, whether it shows up on the screen or not. You simply have to find the icon for that and click it to either display it or to hide it. Also, when you leave, well, we're finished or when you leave the webinar, hopefully you'll stay to the end, uh, you'll see a, a request to take a survey. It's very brief. We encourage you to take it. it. It does help us out. And if you have any technical problems uh, with Zoom, you can send it, uh, the best way to uh, uh, um, get some help is to send an email to info at encorelearning.net and they will uh, try to help you troubleshoot. And also, I want to make sure that people are aware of upcoming events. So on um, Monday, um, well, it's a Monday, February 26th, again at three o'clock. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Richard uh, Forno, and he will cover, cover a wide range of cybersecurity uh, topics. Obviously, cybersecurity uh, is a topic that we've covered before, but it's not going away. So this will help you um, hopefully protect yourself, as well as he'll touch on kind of the larger in the larger context of in warfare and just uh, protecting our nation's infrastructure. Then on March 18th, uh, again on Monday, beginning at three o'clock, we have uh, um, author Tony An uh, Andrews, and she will talk about, um, uh, oops, sorry, her uh, book, A Road to a Second Chance, and uh, she wants to have, very much to have it as a conversation. So we're going to experiment with actually allowing people to raise their hand, and we will selectively open the mics so you can answer, uh, uh, ask a question that way. So that, that'll be a little different, so you may want to put that on your calendar if you're interested in that topic. Um, and um, again, all, all the the future Encore Learning Presents uh, events are, we use the same Zoom number. You can always go to our website and get the link. So uh, let me just stop this share and I want, I'll want i introduce our speaker. So we have with us uh, uh, Vera uh, um, Kochinowski. I think I pronounced that <laughs> hopefully close. And uh, so Vera has uh, actually, this is her second book that she'll be talking about to, today, Boris and Anna, uh, although she also will incorporate some information from her, uh, the first book she wrote, uh, which is uh, Lenin, Hitler and Me, I think if I have that right, because uh, the topic is very similar. She she did give a presentation on her first book, but it's uh, to Encore Learning, but it's been a while. So she's uh, happy to incorporate some uh, information on that as well. And so even though she is now a, an accomplished author, uh, in essence, her, her day job, you want to call it that, is she's a um, um, harp, harp, um, harp, harpist, 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 yeah, thank you, thank you very much, 
<laughs> and she's a teacher and a choral conductor and chamber musician. Uh, after studying music in Europe on a Fulbright uh, grant, she settled in the Washington DC area and founded two early music choirs um, and, uh, um, and a woman's ensemble and has led them for 25 years until her retirement. She continues to teach privately and perform as a keyboard artist. So very accomplished in many ways. So uh, with that, we're, we're very, uh, very ha happy to have her here. And if everyone can give uh, Vera a warm virtual welcome, I'll, I'll hand off and also bring up some slides that she has to some pictures to help her talk. So Vera, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, David. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, thanks to everyone at Encore Learning for inviting me to present this program. I'm delighted to have this chance to re-engage with the Encore Learning audience. Um, special thanks to Laura, David, Patty, and Chris for their assistance in helping me negotiate the technical format, the technical technical aspect of this, um, doing this through Zoom. Last time, of course, that was in 2018. I spoke to a live audience at the Central Library in Arlington about my first book, which is a, a, a revision of my father's memoirs, Lenin, Hitler, and me. Um, at the end, I'm happy to take questions. I hope to reserve about 15 to 20 minutes at the very end, and David will field those questions via the Q&A. David will also be handling the PowerPoint um, slides, so I thank him for that uh, assistance as well. Um, before I begin, I'd like to mention that both of my books are available through online sources like Amazon and may also be ordered from almost any bookstore. Um, I believe that the Arlington, Fairfax County, and Falls Church City libraries also hold copies of Lenin, Hitler, and Me, although they do not yet have uh, Anna and Boris, as came out fairly recently. Um, I found it, I just wanted to say also that I found it quite charming that the Encore Learning um, committee decided to schedule this lecture just prior to Valentine's Day, which uh, was kind of nice. And, uh, you know, Anna and Boris is definitely a love story, but it's not at all a conventional one. So it starts out very normally with a chance meeting, which is extended just long enough um, for the two parties to fall head over heels in love with each other. Um, but that's where the normality ends. Um, they had a difficult time meeting in person uh, because of the strict travel regulations imposed on foreigners. My father was a refugee by the Swiss authorities. Um, and because my, my mother's parents were reluctant as a like dead set against this match, <laughs> so they made it difficult for her to travel to, to meet with him. Um, so my parents, because of their particular situation, were forced to conduct most of their courtship through letters. And in doing so, they encountered numerous stumbling blocks on their path toward marriage, which occurred about tw two years later. Um, and in fact, in the end, their marriage did not survive. Um, they divorced 24 years later in 1970. And as I learned in reading these letters, which are very detailed and personally revealing, um, some of these stumbling blocks they encountered during their courtship did come back to haunt them later on. Um, before I begin, I'd like to just um, explain to you how and why I decided to edit and publish my parents' writings. Um, first of all, I counted myself very lucky to have access to this quantity and quality of writing from both of my parents. It's a very rare thing, especially these days. Um, people just don't tend to write letters like this anymore. And it's rare for really any child to have such an intimate record of one's parents' thoughts, emotions, and intellectual development during their early years, that is before you got to know them yourself. And um, so how did I come to get this material? Uh, first of all, when my father died in 1992, he left me a copy of his memoirs, which were written in English. He wrote them in 1971, just after his retirement from Penn State. He was a professor of mining for 17 years at Penn State. He never kept a diary, so he wrote everything from memory, um, and he wanted to publish his book. He attempted to get it published, and he was unsuccessful. He was also interested in seeing if it would, could be made into a movie, because it is a very exciting story. Um, 
and he made an attempt, but that too met failure. So after he died, it was something that I always um, intended to do in his memory to, to finally, you know, rework them. They needed some, you know, organizing and uh, cleaning up um, and try to get them published. So I started working them, working on this project in about 2008, but it took me eight years to finish this, this book to the point where I felt it was ready for publication. And because many of you have probably may not have heard me speak about um, my father's story. I think it it's, would be valuable for you to know what happened to my father before the point he met my mother. And in fact, his arrival in Switzerland happens about four fifths of the way through his story. So a lot happens to him before that. And in fact, had shaped him quite a bit. Um, now a little bit about my mother, um, how I got the letters that actually um, ended up being this book, um, Anna and Boris, The Love Letters. When my mother passed away in 2000, um, she left me a sizable cardboard box full of papers. And on the top of that uh, pile of papers was a folder full of handwritten letters that she and my father had exchanged during their courtship uh, from the point they met, which was in September of 44, until just before their marriage, which occurred in July of 1946. And my guess was that the reason they were on the top of that stack of papers was because she wanted me, wanted to share with me um, what she had gone through as a teenager and a young adult. And unlike my father who loved to tell stories about his past, he would entertain people at parties with, with funny stories about his, his past. And he chose the humorous ones, of course, for, for parties. Um, so there were a lot of scary ones too. Um, she almost never said anything. She never shared anything about her past and her family. So um, so I was curious about her past and that's partly what drew me to starting to read these letters, which were all in German. So, and I have some German background, so it was doable for me, but it was strenuous to, to read these letters. Um, let's see. So um, I actually didn't even uh, start looking at the letters until after I had finished publishing my father's um, book, Lenin, Hitler, and Me. So after 2016, I started looking through these letters. I found them very moving and very complicated, actually. And I ended up learning a lot about both of my parents um, and what they had gone through before I was born. But especially I learned a lot about my mother. She was such a private person. And because of that, I kind of wrestled with the decision as to whether or not to publish um, her writing. It was his writing too. My father wrote as many letters as she did. There were about over 130 letters altogether. Um, so I kind of wrestled, I kind of debated, went back and forth because I was, I had no doubt. I was certain that she would never have wanted to share her innermost thoughts and feelings with the entire world. So. I vacillated for quite a while, but in the end, I decided to go ahead. Um, not just because it's an incredible, uh, unique family history, um, but because I recognized what an amazing um, transformation she had undergone during this period in her life. Uh, she was 18 to 20 years old and he was 20 years older. He was 38 to 40. And I was actually floored by her wisdom at this young age pulled from her experiences. I always admired my mother very, very much, um, but these letters really drove home to me how, what a remarkable person she was. And of course I could be accused of being biased because she was my mother, <laughs> but now it's been over 25 years since she's passed. And I think I'm really looking at her in a fairly objective light. She was very strong-willed, very talented, kind, and she had this incredible ability to read people. This is a talent that my father really didn't have, um, partly because he had faced so many hardships as a young person. He really had to focus on himself and his own survival and take care of number one. So uh, one more point before I begin their story and how they met. Um, both of my parents actually had been ostracized to some degree by their, by their communities. Uh, and they both were at a point in their lives where they were seeking better lives for themselves. And I think because of their prior experiences, um, they were more willing, I think, than others to kind of look outside the box 
and break some with some society's expectations and conventions of the time, not radically, but, but to some extent. Um, for example, my grandfather, my mother's father was extremely conservative, very strict and an in, in, inflexible sort of person. He really was against the match from the beginning. He never consented to the marriage even two years later. So he was a stickler, good, solid Swiss <laughs> grandfather. Once I came along, of course, he became more accepting. But anyway, so I'm gonna talk about this picture that you see um, on the PowerPoint. Um, these are my parents, Anna and Boris, walking in Vegas, a, a little resort town in Switzerland. This is one of the rare occasions that they got to meet in person. They spent a weekend there in the summer of 1945. And this is really the only picture I have of them together during this period. So naturally I used it for the cover of um, the letters book. And um, we can go to the next picture. <clears throat> Number two, this is a picture of my father. This is, is his 1946 passport picture before he leaves Europe to take his first job after the war in Argentina. It's very, he's very handsome here. And I thought this was a good picture to use as the cover for Lenin, Hitler and me. Now I'm gonna do a, a kind of a quick review of my father's life prior to the point where he meets my mother in Switzerland. And so we're gonna kind of go through a family album. I, I am very lucky to have a lot of wonderful photos of his family. So we're gonna kind of go through them uh, quickly. Uh, the next picture is a picture of my father at age four. Oh no, sorry, this is not, did we miss one? Okay, um, go on to the next picture. I think they're just slightly out of order. The next picture is of his hometown. Oh, there he is, okay. That's my father at age four. He was born in 1905, the youngest in a large wealthy family. He had five brothers and one sister and they lived in the central Siberian city of Krasnoyarsk. So you can go on to the next. It shows a picture of Krasnoyarsk. I, no, go back, <laughs> back to, that's it. It's a picture of Krasnoyarsk uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Um, you can see that there was a large river right next to the town, uh, the mighty Yenisei, about a mile wide. Uh, it was a very inspirational, uh, natural feature that inspired my father very much. He taught himself to swim and cross the river at age 14 after four summers of training. He did it by himself. The town was sizable, uh, about uh, 80,000 residents around the turn of the 20th century. It also was situated um, along the Trans-Siberian Railway. And because of that, because of the river and because of the railway, made it an important center for travel, commerce, and culture. Okay, then we can go to his parents, picture of my father's parents, um, Julius and Maria Kochanowski. My grandfather was a successful businessman um, specializing in everything having to do with paper. He grew the trees, he processed the lumber, he made the paper, and he also established a very successful printing um, office in the basement of, on the first floor of his residence, employed, employing as many as 70 workers um, at the time. So I'm really lucky to have the next picture, which is a picture of their house in Krasnoyarsk. Um, you can see it has two floors. The bottom floor was where the printing presses were, the printing office. Upstairs is where uh, my, my family, my, my father's family lived. So it was quite a nice house. This picture was taken in the 1980s and I don't have no idea if the building is still um, standing today. So that, and I myself have never been able to visit Krasnoyarsk, so I don't know. My father uh, knew someone in Russia who was able to take this photograph and send it to him and, uh, in the 80s before he passed in 1992. Okay, so my grandfather was making money hand over fist in the late 19th, early 20th century until 1919 when the revolution finally arrived at their doorstep. My father had an almost ideal childhood, enjoying every comfort, an elegant house, good education, many cultural and artistic opportunities. And most importantly, he had the love and support of his entire family. Now I'll in introduce you quickly to his older siblings. All of his older brothers and even his sister had received a higher education at the best universities in Europe. My father hoped to follow in their footsteps and make something of himself. So the eldest was Dimitri. Dimitri was, next picture, 
was a doctor. He was a physician. He was 27 years older. Whoop, back, back one. He was 27 years older than my father. So um, the family was spread out quite, uh, quite a bit in age. Uh, Dimitri died of scarlet fever at age 35 when my father was eight, but he still made a big impression on him. He was very um, impressed with both of his brothers who were physicians, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the next brother down was the next um, oldest brother, was uh, or next youngest brother was Matthew, who was very artistically gifted. He helped his father in the printing shop. Um, he was married, had one son. Uh, the next one is the girl, Bertha, or Bertha. Um, she was about 15 years older than my father. She also went to university uh, and studied philology. And I met her granddaughter. I, I really had no contact with any of my Russian side of the family, but I met her granddaughter in 2005. Um, and we were able to talk to her by then because she had moved to Germany. Uh, she was able, we were able to communicate in German. And she revealed to me that um, both of my father's parents had been of Jewish extraction. Neither of my parents ever mentioned that to me, never revealed that to me. So through her, I learned that um, my father was basically 100% a Jewish uh, background. They weren't religious, but that was their, that was their ethnic background. Uh, the next brother was Victor. He was a very handsome man. He was very popular with the ladies but he was somewhat of the black sheep of the family. Um, he spent a lot of time in the Far East. Uh, he was in charge of overseeing the transfer of materials and supplies uh, that my grandfather needed for his businesses. And when my father finally escaped uh, uh, Russia, he went eastward and he met Victor and Berta in Harbin uh, in 1923. Victor unfortunately died in a train crash in Japan in 1928. Okay, next picture is of uh, the brother that was just the next oldest to my father. He was five years older than my father. Uh, he, they were both, both Jacob and my father were talented pianists. He was away attending college when uh, the right white army came through looking for recruits. This is 1917, the second half of 1917. And he, he joined the white army to fight against the communist, uh, communists and the Red Army. So they were forced eastward, kept going eastward, eastward until from the Volga to Krasnoyarsk, about 2000 miles. And uh, there was a big battle, a decisive battle in Krasnoyarsk in uh, around Christmas, 1919. And unfortunately he was killed in that battle just within a mile of his home. Um, so uh, he was 19 years old. And uh, once the warm, a white army was defeated, uh, my, uh, my father's family lost everything. My grandfather's businesses, his bank accounts, all his properties were confiscated by the new communist regime. And my father as a formal capitalist, part of a capitalist family didn't have the right to receive a higher education. This was a crushing blow for him because he had such a uh, bright dreams. Uh, he had dreams for this wonderful future, and they were all dashed because of this. And he soon started thinking about how he might escape this repressive situation. He did attend school under the communist regime, finished high school, but then there was really nothing for him. Um, his family suffered a lot of hardships during this time. Uh, his father was falsely accused of possessing weapons and was almost executed, but for the efforts of one of their former servants who testified in his behalf, the communists believed the servant and he was not executed. So that was good. One more brother to go over is Joseph. Um, my, my father's favorite brother, who was 11 years older than him, was also a physician. Um, my father admired him for his selfless dedication to helping those less fortunate in the middle of the night. If he got a call, he would get up and go out and help anybody and would never ask for any money. So he was always out there helping people. And this really impressed my father. Um, after the defeat of the White Army, Joseph was forced to serve with the Red Army. He was conscripted, they call that. Um, and because of his position with the, the Red Army, he was finally able to arrange passage, train passage for my father and his parents to travel to the next large city along the 
the Trans-Siberian Railway, which was Irkutsk, about uh, 800 miles to the east. And my father was always trying to see how could he get further east? How could he, how could he get out of Russia? And they're just month after month he tried and he just couldn't figure out how to, how to, get, how to get out of there. But um, through sheer luck and an unexpected turn of events, he was finally permitted to travel only with his mother. His father had to stay behind to the far east, to Harbin. And that's where he met Victor and Berta. And at that point, he was out. And he had the choice as to whether to study in the U.S. or somewhere else. Um, and a, a close family friend recommended to him that he study mining engineering. Um, and he followed the He said, Mother Russia will need mining engineers after the counter-revolution. And my father, of course, had wanted to be a, a concert pianist. Um, actually, let's go to the next slide. I can show you on the map um, how he traveled. Uh, Krasnoyarsk is on the far left. And then you can see Irkutsk near, the, near Lake Baikal. So that's that was the first stop. And then finally, um, through chance and actually falling in with a, a, a woman who wanted, he, he was playing piano and this woman overheard him and asked all about his background. And he told her everything. It turned out she was the um, girlfriend of the chief of police. So she um, got her boyfriend to give him permission and his mother, since she was so ill, to travel from Irkutsk all the way to the right. You can see Harbin um, in the Mongolian, this is the Manchurian plain there. And there he spent about a year uh, preparing to go to college somewhere. And he could have gone to the US at that time, which was where he wanted to go, at that point, it would have been easier for him to get, really easy for him to get to the U.S. Um, but, but for this advice that um, that this friend of the family gave him, and he realized that he really, being a concert pianist was not a secure enough career. So he decided, why not? I'll be a mining engineer. So, um, so it ended up taking him another thirty years to get to the U.S. Oh, so uh, around Christmas, nineteen twenty-three, he boards a boat. Two months later, he ends up in Marseille. Said goodbye to his mother and his brother, Victor, whom he never saw again. He was 17 years old. Um, and from Marseille, he traveled by train to Germany, Freiburg, Germany, where he enrolled in their famous, world famous School of Mines, from which he graduated in 1929 with two degrees. Unfortunately, because of it, it being the depression at that time in 1929, he was unable to emigrate to the US and nor was he permitted as a foreigner to seek any employment in Germany. So this was a really big uh, problem for him. He, he had to stay, but he couldn't work. So, but through clever means, he managed to get around this rule. And for almost 10 years, he enjoyed a successful career working himself up in the German mining industry in 1933, he landed a great job and at this mine, you can go to the next picture, the Rheinische Kalksteinwerker, which is, was the largest open pit limestone stone quarry in Europe. He worked there until 1939, had a lot of success, um, studied blasting, became an expert in blasting, and had a fantastic uh, boss who treated him like a son. And I have a picture of Lud Paul Ludwig, that's the next picture. Uh, he was very important in my father's life. He actually got him out of Germany when things got kind of nasty for him. Uh, in the fall of 38, my father experienced and witnessed Kristallnacht. And after that experience, um, he became less and less comfortable with the way things were evolving in Germany politically. And because uh, he was so focused on his work, he really wasn't cued in or keyed into what was going on politically, which he should have been, but he was too focused. <laughs> he tried to emigrate to Sweden and other countries, but could find no country that would accept him. Finally, in March 1939, my father was denounced as a Jew. The Nazis researched and found out that his parents had been Jewish. He lost his job. He lost most of his friends, except for Mr. Ludwig, who eventually found him a guide so that he could cross the border illegally into Holland and then finally into Belgium, which is a hair-raising story of how he crossed this border, the second border he had to cross so far. Um, he worked as a coal miner. He was able to get a job as a coal miner in Belgium for six months until the Germans attacked um, in May of 1940, Holland, Belgium, and France. And he, along with a million Belgians, 
walked for five days into Paris, just hours ahead of the Germans. In Paris, my father was sent directly to the south of France, ending up in Marseille, where he remained working as a waiter in a soup kitchen for two and a half years. Again, he tried to get to the U.S. at this point. He applied for a visa. He was granted a visa after two years. He bought a boat ticket, was about to leave, when in November of 42, the Germans took over the south of France and closed the border. So again, he was trapped. He couldn't, he couldn't get out. Um, certain members of the French resistance, knowing of his escape from Nazi Germany, were kind of keeping an eye out for him. And at this point, advised him to get out of town and take the next train into the high Alps. So for more than a year, my father hid out at various Alpine towns and villages under the protection of the French resistance until finally he received word that he had been granted permission to cross the border into Switzerland. He had to get permission. You can just walk across the border. And this escape is also hair raising in the middle of the night, in the snow, Christmas Eve, walking for hours, finally caught, but given permission to stay. So at this point, Late 1943, my father is essentially safe you know, in Switzerland. So now we'll go to how my parents met. All right. So, um, yeah, okay, I'll explain this program in a second. Um, my father was transferred to an, a refugee camp, which is very lovely. It was one of these grand hotels on top of a mountain where everyone was well taken care of. Care of. Um, they had good food. They had a lovely rooms. They were entertained. But after a few months of this life, my father got impatient and wanted to do something more constructive with his life. He thought he might be able to get permission to study at the Technical University in Zurich. But the director of the camp wouldn't give him permission to leave the camp to take the interview. So he thought of a plan. His plan was to get together with another uh, refugee in the camp and put on a concert. As I said, there was a lot of entertainment lectures and so uh, put on by the, many times by the refugees themselves. Unfortunately, he hadn't practiced the piano for, for seriously for many years, um, but he started to try, there was a nice piano there and he started to try to recall some of the pieces he'd known as a teenager, um, you know, half a life ago uh, by memory. He had some, a lot of music by memory. So he's trying to put together uh, enough so that he could play a concert. Turned out the concert was a great success. You can see there's a professor, Vittorio Basevi was the cellist and this is what they played on March, I think it was March 11th. Oh, no, I can't see. It was in March of uh, 1944. Oh, here it is. Um, 15th of March, 1944 at 8.15. So as a result of this pro performance, the director of the camp relented and allowed him to go for three days to Zurich to take the interview. He was accepted at the university and permitted to rent a room in Zurich and have a bit more of a normal life, um, make progress in his field in mining. Then uh, my father had never been a religious person. His family, he, he'd grown up in a family. My, my husband will get that, sorry about <laughs> the phone. Um, he had grown up in a family of free thinkers. So none of them practiced any religion not Judaism, not Christianity, not orthodoxy, nothing. Uh, they may have celebrated Christmas, I, I think, because my father loved Christmas. So I'm thinking that he probably did celebrate Christmas. Um, but while he was hiding out in the French Alps under the care and protection of members of the resistance, many of whom were religious leaders, he came to really admire them and saw them as moral heroes like his brother Joseph had been helping people out of the kindness of their hearts without any regard um, for their own comfort or safety. And his attitude toward religion changed. He, he developed a, a newfound interest in Christianity, Christianity and studying um, the teachings of Jesus, um, which led him to take an advantage of an opportunity he saw at the university. He saw an advertisement for a two week Bible study class offered by a Swiss minister who ran a religious community in the small village of Guat on the Lake of Thun. And my mother was one of the residents there. So here's a picture of Guat, the next picture. Um, it's right on the lake and you can see the Alps behind it. It's a very small village. And the house on the far right is where my mother lived. And attached to that 
um, building was a large room where they had their meals and where sometimes they had guest lecturers, they could do classes. And I suspect that's where my father's um, Bible study class took place. Um, I have uh, the, the area that that building has now been uh, destroyed. It's no longer there, but the whole air, this whole little uh, place along the lake is still, uh, it's called Delta Park now, and it's still a religious conference center. I believe that the building on the left is still there, but but the house in which my mother lived is, has been just um, torn down. I think there's a larger building there now. You can go to the next slide, which is actually the building where my mother lived. I have a picture. This is a postcard, um, and then you can see that big white structure attached to the dormitory is where um, they would hold classes and also have their meals. So. Um, so now we'll turn to my mother's background and we'll, we'll look at her family album <laughs> next. Um, the next picture is of my mother at age one with her mother, Rosa, Rosa Berchi. She was um, Berchi and she married my grandfather who was Stahel. Uh, my mother was born in the large Northern Swiss city of Winterthur. It was an industrial town. It was very much a middle-class family. And she was, like I said, the only child. Her father, Hans, was a master cabinet maker who had inherited his business from his own father. <clears throat> Her mother had worked, Rosa had worked as a nanny before she married. And by all accounts, she was a very warm, friendly sort of person. Uh, my mother had a very close relationship with her mother, but unfortunately not with her father. Soon with her, soon after their marriage, Rosa and Hans discovered that they really were not that well suited to each other. So on most nights after work, Hans would go to the local tavern, drink beer, and play cards. So all through her childhood, my, my mother never developed a close relationship with her father, unfortunately. Here's a picture of my grandfather, Hans Stahel, a very handsome man. This is in 1939. Um, and then after, uh, the, there's another picture of Rosa and Anna in 1939. Now, uh, my mother is 13. And her mother, uh, Rosa, is 37. This is the last picture of them together. Rosa, unfortunately, contracted tuberculosis and died later that year, that in the summer, when Anna was only 13 and a half years old. Um, she was fast approaching the important and difficult years of adolescence and really needed her mother's support and guidance. And this lack in her life uh, really impacted her, hit her very hard, and contributed to her insecurities and lack of self-esteem. Once World War II started, Hans joined the uh, Swiss Army. Of course, the Swiss Army didn't fight battles, but they patrolled the border. Yeah. So there were, um, he had served earlier uh, in World War I and uh, was now back in the Army and was often away on weekends on maneuvers. So he had even less contact with his daughter unfortunately, but another family member sort of stepped in. Uh, this is Rose's mother, Anna Berchi, uh, who is a very strong influence on my mother. She sort of stepped in and became more involved with my mother and kind of took her under her wing and um, they became very close. Anna Berchi um, became sort of a role model and, um, but she was very religious, very religious. And most of her, her, um, her other children were very religious too. I did get to know some of those um, relatives. And this may be the time in Anna's life when religion became very important and she became a devout Christian. And it's probably something that helped her, you know, deal with the loss of her mother. So next picture, um, soon after my grandfather joined the army, he met and fell in love with Marta Gimme, the woman on the right. And in 1941, married her and she became my mother's stepmother. And this, she was the only grandmother I, I ever knew. Um, Martha was a, we said Marta, but it's Martha, um, was a seasoned businesswoman of 28 years when she married and she had never been married before. She could be very fun loving, as you can see from her big smile, <laughs> but she also could be a bit on the cool, cool and prickly side too. Um, she of the two were a little bit more open to my father than, than, than Hans was. But despite her, and that's my mother, she's probably about you know 15 there. Um, despite her newfound religion and her new stepmother, Anna keenly felt the lack of love and support in her life. 
And because she was so very attractive and charming and mature looking for her age, um, she soon and um, she soon attracted many admirers, classmates, as well as older men who pursued her. She was flattered and responded in several cases and soon her reputation suffered. So after graduation from secondary school, which would have been about like 10th grade here, her parents decided it would be best for her to live in a religious community away from home where she could be fairly strictly supervised. My mother agreed to go as she probably wished to escape the people in her community who now she believed thought badly of her. It became a kind of what became a kind of refuge for her. Okay, let's go back. Um, the next picture is the first one that we started with walking in Vegas. Um, let's turn to the love story now since it's almost Valentine's Day. And um, so any love story, any story really isn't all that interesting, I think, unless there are obstacles. And there certainly were a lot of obstacles between these two people. And here are a few of them as they are discussed and defied by them themselves. The age difference, he was almost 40. She was 19 in this picture. Um, this is something that my grandfather pointed out right away. <laughs> but think of the age difference. Education, he'd had an undergraduate, a master's degree, uh, beginning his doctorate already, um, 10 years of work experience, a lot of exposure to the arts, to science, to literature. She had only a secondary education, a 10th grade level education, little exposure to the to higher academics or fine arts. Family situation was different. He was from a wealthy, large family that was highly supportive of him and his ambitions. Uh, so he had a very strong self-image and a high, strong self-esteem. She was from a small, somewhat dysfunctional family, not close to her father, lost her mother young, a, a more because she was a woman, it was a more restrictive environment, and you know, she was middle class, not wealthy. And in her milieu, there really wasn't much emphasis placed on higher education. He was not religious, he was interested in religion, but he was not religious. She was very religious, so this was a big issue between them that they had to kind of resolve, you know, before they could wed. Um, he had had complete freedom in his life from age 17. He was totally on his own. He could do whatever he wanted to. He had a lot of ambition to better himself and the world and to pursue lofty goals. She, as a female, had fewer options, little self-esteem, few professional ambitions for herself. She was studying sewing and upholstery, doing a three-year apprenticeship in tune when they met. So he was, she was kind of in the middle of this apprenticeship going to tune six days a week and working there. So the letters between them, um, you know, show where they were as a person uh, when they met and follow their development over the course of the next two years. My father's character was pretty well established by this time, uh, but my mother undergoes a tremendous transformation in these months. He exposes her to all kinds of new things, music, art, literature, philosophy, science in these, in these letters. And, and more, you know, and attempting to broaden her education and bring her up to his level. And she soaks it all up like a sponge and comes out on the other side vastly changed and for the better. Um, so to me, this makes this letters book, uh, it makes her the heroine of this book. Yeah. Whereas he is the hero of Lenin, Hitler and me. She is the heroine of these letters. Okay. Now I'd like to actually turn, we can keep this picture up for a while now. I'm gonna to turn to the letters themselves and read some um, excerpts. I hopefully find, you'll find intriguing. Um, I mentioned um, that, um, that they were discussing many, besides, you know, of course, sending nice little love notes to each other. They were talking about major issues and lots of, lots of uh, different people. Uh, there are many references to port figures of the day, politicians, writers, philosophers, musicians, artists. Many are briefly mentioned, but some, some are discussed in more depth. Um, and next I would like to actually read a few passages from the letters and um, that exhibit that, that show some uh, indication of the political, moral, and social climate in Switzerland at this time. And also there are examples of xenophobia, uh, 
baseless fear, dislike, or prejudice against foreigners. And um, so uh, these are all documented in the letters. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of, of um, a few of these. Uh, my father recalls how his professional expertise was dismissed by the director of the Belgian mine he worked for in 1940. He calls it a shabby, closed-minded egoism. He explains to Annalie on January 24th, 1946. When I was a refugee in Belgium, I had all my documents and references with me as proof of my expertise. Being a top expert in blasting in Germany, I offered to advise the director of the mine under whom I was working in Belgium in 1940. He said, Belgian engineers are the best in the world. We don't need any foreigners. Just imagine this was during the war when every technician professional was desperately needed. Okay, some examples of xenophobia in Switzerland. My mother who had to get permission from her head teacher to visit my father as well as her parents, um, told her teacher about my father having met him and this is what her teacher said. Well, this is what Anna says about her teacher. I told my teacher briefly that I had met a man whom I would like to get to know better. I told her that you were Russian and that you had lived in Europe for the past 20 years. Of course, she had nothing but objections. In her opinion, we would have no future. She said, quote, Slavs have a different kind of blood than we. Um, here's a letter uh, from her father, who's totally against the match, as I mentioned. Um, he's, she's asking permission to visit Boris and Zurich. Zurich and Guat are pretty far apart, uh, not, in their, not in the same neighborhood at all. Um, so he says, Anneli, we did not have a very good Sunday as it was entirely consumed with this business concerning this immigrant. Think about the huge age difference as far as this relationship with Mr. Kochanowski goes compared with Swiss relationships which with, with which we and you are involved. This one is just impossible. The whole affair for you and for us is so inscrutable and hopeless, but I hope you don't, I don't want to, I don't care to waste any more time on this or words on it. So let us close the subject and you will stay in Guat next Sunday. And she only had Sunday off. So. All right, uh, later on, after they marry, Anna stays behind for a few months uh, while he goes off to Argentina and begins his job. She doesn't follow for a few months. So she stays behind, she takes a tour of Italy and she describes this tour to Boris in October of 1946. Dear Boris, but now I must tell you about my trip to Italy. And this just shows her open-mindedness, yeah, unlike some other Swiss. Switzerland now appeals to me far less than before. Yes, everything here is well-organized, clean and comfortable, but Swiss people are just not as relaxed or cheerful as the people of the South. In short, I'm completely excited about my Italian experience. I would like to continue traveling until I have seen the whole world. And she does, she was a big traveler. She loved to travel. She loved to learn about other cultures. He goes on and says, my trip was quite exhausting, but wonderful. Because we rode around in a bus, we had a lot of contact with the local people. I must say that one often makes poor, false assumptions about the Italians. In truth, they are not at all unpleasant. <laughs> so anyway. Even when I was a little girl in Switzerland, I noticed that the Swiss really did not treat the foreign workers very well. They were subclass citizens. And that shocked me, even as a six-year-old. I, I noted that. But, you know, it might be different now. Okay, so uh, about the end of 44, beginning of 45, the war is about to end. My father's thinking about where can they go? Uh, where can he get a job? Where can they be welcomed in the world? So very surprisingly, he starts thinking about going back to Russia, which is doesn't make any sense to me, but he did. He thought about going back to Russia. So here he's, he's proposing this to Anna in these letters here. I'm going to read a few excerpts. Uh, December 11th, 1944. Dear Anna Lee, in the worst case, I will have to give up on America. He's still hoping to go to America and become a Russian citizen so that you will not be lost to me. I propose Russia as a back, backup plan if we can't get to America, if you do not object. Don't be afraid. We'll be able to survive even in Russia. 
If I apply for citizenship there, I hope I would not be at risk as I never professed allegiance to any political group and left Russia when I was a minor. Six months later, he's still thinking about Russia and he's thinking about what it would be like to work in Russia and live in Russia. He says, if one is an idealist, which he considered himself an idealist, one ought to go to Russia. Of course, one can do good in the United States and all over the world too, but in Russia, your value is determined by the yardstick of the state. And he seems to think this is a good thing. <laughs> If I were certain I would suffer no consequences because of my past in Russia, I would first go to the United States to further my professional experience. Then I would put myself 100% in the service of Russia. Perhaps Russia will become more transparent eventually. Ha ha, yeah. So I find these thoughts uh, very startling coming from someone who 25 years earlier had been persecuted by the communists in Russia where he was denied an advanced education, where his prop family's property and fortune were seized, and where his father was falsely accused and nearly murdered. Very hard for me to understand why he's considering Russia here. I think he's just panicked about where they were gonna go after the war and trying to paint a rosy picture for my mother about what things might be like in Russia, making a lot of assumptions. But on the other hand, he does express some reservations about Russia in the same letter. He says, what I don't like about Russia is that it holds up materialism as an ideal. And this batters a person psychologically and that one is in danger of viewing people as machines without souls. Human beings are thereby devalued. The main objective is for citizens to work hard and develop their talents to be of service to the state. And in this, uh, this way they are, uh, is this work that is most highly valued. And in this way, one steps a little closer to the Christian ideal of serving one's fellow man, despite everything. Yet the current tone of this in Russia is mechanical, technical, industrial, and rationalistic. That is soulless, heartless, loveless, and godless. So he knows, you know, there are, there are problems in Russia. So Anna's response to all this, very uh, amazing. I find it. She responds to his ideas about going to Russia in a letter of August, 1945. Dear Boris, I would like to come back to our discussion about Russia. I don't see why you feel you must return to Russia if you are a genuine idealist. No nationalistic country understands or appreciates purely creative work. You want to work for the benefit of mankind, not for the benefit of a single nationalist power. Russia is and remains a big question mark and that one cannot really tell whether its politics and policies will benefit or harm its people. In any case, its act of power are not ethical and neither is its propaganda. Boris, you taught me that life must be protected above all else. If you are against Christians who kill people because they would not convert to Christianity, how can you now support Stalin who kills people for political reasons? Where does he get the right to do this? He's only a human being. Go mom. Anyway, um, so that is dropped. The whole idea of going to Russia is completely dropped when my father gets a job offer from uh, through the help of a former classmate, um, Gerhard Grossman in Argentina. So then they start thinking about going to South America. That's the next uh, sort of chapter in, in the letters. So now I wanna to turn to uh, the, one of the biggest differences they had was their, uh, their view of religion. Their, so um, Anna does undergo a, 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 tra a transformation on a religious level also. Um, so first, as I said, she was very devout and pious and believed in everything the Bible said. And so um, we hear in the letters here how her attitudes change gradually. And it's pretty remarkable, I think. In a letter uh, of December, 1944, Anna's religious beliefs are threatened by this lecture she heard. And she describes the lecture to, to my father. Dear Boris, yesterday evening, Dr. Stroop, and I'm, I don't know who Dr. Stroop was, but obviously he gave a lecture about the beginning of the world, the ice age, and that man evolved from apes, and what all else I don't know. 
Then suddenly it dawned on me that he's the kind of person who always thinks he knows more than God does and wants to know more than God tells us. The way to God is blocked off for these people because they do not have a childlike faith in him. People should return to that kind of simplicity. How does it help for us to know that humans descended from apes? God tells us he created us. Whether he created us from apes or not isn't really so important. The main thing is he created us. I believe God's power was so great, is so great, that he could have chosen to create us in other ways as well. So that's her rationalizing. <laughs> anyway, um, five months later, her attitude is softening a bit uh, about religion. She says, dear Boris, I do not want to be a piously religious person anymore, but a sensible one instead. The world interests me more than heaven does. That's beautiful. Three months later, in July 1944, comes an even more startling revelation concerning religion and her attitude towards religion, and particularly the resurrection. Okay, so dear Boris, and this is the last little snippet I'm going to read about religion, and we're going to go to some other, other um, quotes. Okay, dear Boris, truth resides in the world of the spirit. Truth is the way, and the world must ultimately go the way of truth, whether it wants to or not. Truth stands rock solid. It is unshakable. Christ is the embodiment of this truth, and that is why Christ said, I am the way and the truth, and that is why Christ's resurrection was inevitable. Whether it was a spiritual or physical resurrection is not so important. Truth is the godly principle, and it is as permanent and strong as any of nature's laws. But one cannot grasp it by seeing it physically, but only with one's spirit. Okay, let that sink in a little. All right, so um, there were surfacing towards the end of the two-year period some areas of disagreement. Um, they begin seeing some objectionable traits in the other. The rosy glow of first love is wearing off a bit. And some serious complaints start to surface in the letter. So I'm going to go over some of the objections they um, point out in each other and that they feel they need to address. So his re reservation about her was mostly because she had a very fiery temper. She couldn't take criticism too well. She would get very defensive. So he's saying, this is just a month before they get married, June of 1946. My father says, dear Annalie, while I was in transit today, I thought a lot about you. I had trouble shaking off a nagging uneasiness as we have been quarreling a lot lately. Each time we try to put the blame on something else, overwork, nervousness, a temporary stressful situation. I think it is simple pigheadedness. I'm right, you're wrong, and poor self-control. If this is just a passing problem, then it probably isn't too dangerous. Should it become more constant, however, my patience would eventually come to an end. Even little drops of water falling continually on stone can make a hole, that's the scientist to him. And then there would be suffering, crises and catastrophes in our marriage. And I don't want to undergo suffering and crises because of mounting trifles. Don't upset yourself too much about this, but in the future, please try to control yourself better. I think our future depends on it. Her reservations about him, two very important reservations that do come back to haunt them, haunt her in the end. Boris was very demanding, asking her to take on a lot of responsibilities and learn a lot of new skills. Um, he knew she was hardworking and smart. And so he put a lot of pressure on her and continued to throughout their marriage. So. Okay, here she's complaining about all the things he wants her to do. February 3rd, 1946. Dear Boris, you burden me with far more responsibilities than what is reasonable. I am responsible for what you will do in the future and for your spiritual condition. I must also care for your physical well-being, study English, Spanish, and French, and practice the piano. I should study art and history, and further, I should learn how to type and take shorthand. And if possible, I should also earn money and take care of your correspondence. But Boris, I'm not a horse. I'm only a woman. 
The other point that she makes several times towards the end is the fact that, as I mentioned, Boris is very self-centered, very self-oriented, and she often feels that he doesn't understand her. So again, February 1946, dear Boris, sometimes I would like to tell you a little story about something I experienced that touched my heart, but I can't because I know even before I begin that you won't take the trouble to understand what I'm saying and will simply brush it aside with an indifferent remark. These are small details, but extremely important ones. You wrote in your last letter that you would like to help me and stand by me, but you didn't know how to do it. I would like to explain something to you. The biggest help that one person can be to another is to give understanding to the other. Boris, understanding someone means being able to put yourself in his place and grasp his true nature. You see, putting your soul into the soul of another is the most beautiful result of a happy union between a man and a woman. Dear, this help of one soul to another is more valuable than a hundred gifts. Okay, we can go to the next picture now. Okay, these are their passport pictures from 1946. Um, They're both very handsome people, <laughs> I think. Uh, Anna finishes her apprenticeship in tune and returns home to Venture Tour in the spring of 1946. Living with her parents is stressful for her. She feels very unhappy there. And an abrupt shift, she stops complaining about Boris, lays her misgivings aside and decides to marry my father and get out of Switzerland. She really wants to get out of Switzerland. She says in her letter, don't worry, everything will be fine. <laughs> so they marry the end of July and neither of Anna's parents attend the wedding. I think my, her father was still dead, sent against it and probably didn't let her stepmother attend. They then take a 10 day honeymoon in the Swiss Alps. And then on August 9th, my father flies off to Argentina to take the job in the asphalt type mine called Minicar, way up in the Andes Mountains, far to the west, western, uh, midwestern Argentina. It's a very uh, remote area. And Anna is to follow him in a few months. But after the war, traveling was pretty difficult. Um, tickets were hard to come by. You had to wait months sometimes to get a ticket. Planes were unsafe. Many of them crashed. This is commercial planes were crashing frequently. And boats were very overcrowded. So. Uh, there is a, another set of letters that I um, discovered after pretty much having finished the, the letters that were in that top folder. There were other letters underneath from the period uh, between the time they married and the time my mother arrived in Argentina. So another four month period, there were about 20 more letters. So he describes the flight to, um, to South America. The flight was very exhausting. Imagine leaving London at 11 a.m. and then being in the air almost constantly for 34 hours. It was hard to sleep because we had to stay in our seats the whole time and it was horribly noisy. I wrapped cloth around my head, but it made very little difference. I also had to endure the constant shaking and heaving of the plane as it went up and down. I think there were small planes, yeah. And when we hit air pockets or went through the clouds. Uh, a little bit later, the next month, September 46, he advises Anna to take a boat instead of the plane. I strongly suggest you travel by boat, not plane. Crashes are just too prevalent. The airline I took lost one of its planes in a crash in September on September 8th. I had hair raising experiences on my trip. We had motor problems three times. It was so noisy I couldn't sleep. Traveling by ship will be much more relaxing and therefore better for you. So my mother had to find a way to get to Argentina on her own, which was no, no, no easy task. So she complains, September 17th, 1946. Boris, I still have no boat ticket. I've been in touch with three different travel agencies and I'm told I can do nothing, but wait, wait, wait. If nothing comes of this, I may end up flying after all. A month later, October 15th, she says, Boris, as far as my trip goes, I'm still quite frustrated and I have no nothing definite to report yet. Everyone is having difficulty obtaining tickets for travel. I'm not the only one. All we can do is wait and hope for the best. 
A couple of weeks later, at the end of October, she finally gets passage on a French ocean liner, the SS Campana, which will be leaving Marseille on November 15th. And she does get a ticket and does travel on that boat to South America. I have a picture of the boat that she traveled on, the SS Campana, so next picture. Next picture, please, there it is, yeah. So, and she's writing Boris from the top deck of this boat and she's facing the rear looking, um, they're going down uh, along the coast of Africa. So here's what she says, November 20th, 1946. Dear Boris, we left a whole day late. The boat is overfilled with passengers. I'm on the top level of the rear deck now, the only place on board that is not packed with people. Today, I'm finally relaxed enough to really enjoy the trip. I could take the time to admire the blue sky the deep blue sea, and to the right on the horizon, a beautiful brick red strip of land, the coast of Africa. A thousand loving kisses from your little wife. So, okay, so she's on her way. He said two weeks to get for her to get from Switzerland to where my father is in the Western part of Argentina. And it's very high up in the mountains. It's a beautiful, dramatic a landscape, windswept, very little vegetation. But my father says it's very colorful. The rocks are very colorful and the sky is very dramatic. Um, so here's a picture. It's a black and white picture. So, um, but you can get an idea of what it was like to live there. The climate was very extreme, very cold um, in the winters. So it was a large um, asphaltite mine probably the largest in Argentina. And uh, they spent two and a half years there. Um, and then uh, he got a professorship at, in San Juan at a mining school. And then they spent four years in San Juan before they finally got their visas to get to the US, uh, arriving in the US in uh, January of 1953, uh, where my father, uh, they spent the first few months in New York where he looked for a job, taking interviews and such, and finally, received an offer from uh, Penn State University, which is where they moved in August of 1953 and where I was born four years later. Um, but I have one more picture of them in Minicar, this little mining community. There's my father and my mother and the other gentleman is Gerhard Grossmuck who actually found this job for my father and was a very close friend of his during the student days, their student days at the School of Mines in Freiburg. Um, so I'm actually coming to the end here and thank you so much for your um, kind attention. I uh, just close by saying that I feel again, I uh, feel very fortunate to have these large quantities of my parents writing uh, writings and where, where they re are very revealing of themselves, their attitudes and their life experiences. And today it's so rare to find writing like this um, these letters show that my parents were flawed human beings, just as we all are, but they also show how amazingly resilient and resourceful they were while also being and remaining so very different from each other. Um, I'll just uh, also mention that I am interested in finding other opportunities to lecture about either of these books or both of these books. Um, and to get in touch with me, uh, you can. I, I talk to book clubs, uh, bookstores, uh, different organizations that look for um, lectures about history. Um, and if you're, uh, if you know of an opportunity that you'd like to share with me, please contact Encore Learning, and they'll forward your email to me. So, and I'd like to thank everyone again, and I will turn things over to David in case there are any questions. Yeah, no, that was fantastic, Vera. And I, I highly encourage people to to to, to read the book. I, I read the book and there, I mean, Vera covered kind of the broad uh, content of the letters, but there's a lot in there. I just found them fascinating and I found it fascinating that you can be a part really of the relationship and seeing how it developed from, you know, the very beginning infatuation stage to, as Vera indicated, the, you know, at some point everyone... Uh, in a relationship knows that uh, you settle down and try to find a way that uh, you can work with each other's idiosyncrasies. Uh, so uh, I, I just found it fascinating to be a part. You just feel like you're a part of that relationship as it, as it develops. But I want to stay here before I um, take the pictures down. 
I, I found this a very enduring, interesting picture um, because your your dad is seeming very serious. Obviously, he has to work uh, being responsible for the mind. And your mom seems very relaxed in this picture, which I think, you you know, she mentioned that it was a very supportive community. I don't know, maybe you can take this opportunity to talk a little bit more about the, the couple of years they spent uh, living in, in this um, uh, this mine, because that seemed like an interesting period for them, as you know, uh, even though it was a, sh a shorter period of the whole or their whole life together. Right. Sure. I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, so it was a very tiny community of about a thousand people, uh, which included the miners and their families. They had their own school, their own police station, their own uh, doctor. They didn't have a hospital. So if you were really sick, you'd have to travel like three, 300 kilometers to the next clinic to, you know, the next major town. Um, very, very remote, but very beautiful. And I think my mother, as I said, was really desperate to get out of Switzerland. And this was a very, I would say, a fairly relaxed community. Everybody, you know, had to work together to build a life there and everybody knew everybody else. So I think um, it was a wonderful place to start their marriage. They had their own little house. I think this is probably the house that they, you know, he was pretty high up. He was, um, I mean, maybe not the director, but he was, you know, a manager of the mine. So he got his own little house. Um, that they built for him. And, um, you know, she set up housekeeping. She was expert sewing and upholstery. So I'm sure she had fun setting up her first household. So I think it was a fairly happy time for them. Yeah, they went horseback riding a lot, right? Yeah, there were horses. I think they had a dog and um, a lot of outdoor, you know, spent a lot of time outdoors when it wasn't, you know, extremely cold. So, right. But, yeah. Okay. I'm going to uh, stop sharing here the pictures and we do have some questions that have rolled in. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, one of them um, is uh, from uh, Catherine. It's a wonderful uh, preservation of your parents' stories. What advice might you offer to others thinking of writing their family stories? Ah, that... Uh... I just want to clarify if there is no written material by the family members that you're writing about, are you just going to, I'm not sure if that could be clarified, whether they have material that they can access for this, or are they just taking it from their own memory? Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe Catherine can uh, provide clarification, but um, yeah, I mean, go ahead and address your situation with where you have the materials and kind of, okay. I guess, to walk us through, the process, obviously, you had to translate these, but just what your thought process was in terms of presenting them to the world, I guess. Okay. Well, of course, for the first one, my father had already written his memoirs. Um, they were poorly organized, and they were, in English, it was his fifth language, so it was pretty rocky writing. Um, but I also interviewed him. I took a, if you still have relatives that are alive, it's really good to make a, you know, list of questions and tape, tape the interview, record the interview to go back over later. I did glean some additional information about his childhood that I was able to add to the story uh, later on. So it's really, these tapes are, and I still have the tapes, um, I, you know, this many years after he died, which is wonderful. Um, so any little scrap of, you know, historical research is also helpful in some cases, but I, I wouldn't get too buried in historical research because because it's really your, your own story that you want to put out there in the forefront. Um, so my father did, put little passages about the history of what was going on and about the generals that were involved in the revolution and the white side and the red side. So there was a little bit of history, but you really want to put the family story front and center. Um, so any anything, any scrap of information that you can get, that you can preserve from the actual person you're writing that about is crucial to, to maintain and maintain the integrity of that. So, um, and of course, from your own memory, you know, that's the secondary source, but it's your own memory of what they said or and or um, how they acted or how they, um, what their relationship was like with other family members, things like that. Um, that's valuable for your, if you saw that and you could describe it, that's, that's helpful for your, for, um, you know, future generations to understand because there's so little, my mother said so little about her mother. So all I knew knew about my grandmother, my real grandmother was that she was very friendly and loved to entertain her family and friends. Um, and that's really all I knew. <laughs> and she never told me anything else. So um, I I regret that. And, and my father too said very little about his parents. I know that they liked to go to the theater. They liked to dress up. They, he, his father worked very hard, got up at 6.30 in the morning and 
went to the train station every day, you know, so just little bits, but, you know, he told me what he wanted to tell me and he told me a lot. So he loved to tell stories, you know, sort of on a social and social occasions. And then he, he never kept a diary, but he remembered everything because he told stories all the time. So he, he just wrote it from beginning to end. And um, so that's a, that's a great thing. So I, I advise anybody, um, especially if you want to share your stories with your children or your grandchildren, um, I find this of great value. So, and they may too. So um, putting something in black and white um, is an excellent, excellent thing to do. So I, I uh, encourage everybody to do that. Yeah, and uh, uh, Catherine clarifies that uh, she's thinking of drawing on written material, memory, photos, other stories, and even DNA, which is interesting. In your uh, case, you have, even though you sat down with your father, um, he did not reveal that that he had Jewish background, right? I think they wanted to protect me, and uh, they, you know, in the forties, it wasn't a good thing to be Jewish. It was very dangerous, and so I think they just made the decision not to share that with me. But if I, you know, I haven't done the DNA studies, the Ancestor.com yet. I may do that at some point, and um, I suspect that his family came from Poland because Kochanowski is a Polish name. And his mother's name is Borowski, which is also a Polish name. So I think that their and their bedroom furniture was from Poland. So, <laughs> so I know that they had, uh, you know, close connections with other family in Poland. And I don't know of any other family in Krasnoyarsk other than his parents and his siblings. So I yeah, think they were fairly yeah. new, new to Siberia. Um, you know, maybe one generation. So, right. is it? Did yes. I answer the question? <laughs> I, yeah, I think so. I think that, yeah, I did a very good job. And we do have some of the questions rolling on, uh, rolling in, so let's uh, yep. go ahead and move on to those. So one yep. of them is, which language fluencies did each of your parents have? Oh, okay. Well, my father grew up in Russia. Um, I think he studied English a little bit in Russia, but not not usefully. Um, then he moved to Germany, so his, at 17, so he, he, and he lived there 15 years. So he, German was his second la language. And then, of course, he lived two and a half years in France, so he had to learn French. And then he went to Argentina, had to learn Spanish. And then finally, at age 48, he had to go. He finally uh, achieved his dream and got to the U.S. and had to learn English. So his English was, he had a very thick accent. Um, English, he could get by, but it wasn't, it wasn't his, it was his fifth language. So, and he wrote the memoirs in, in English. So that's why they were rough. And my mother, of course, um, knew German and Swiss German and studied French in school. Um, and then she learned Spanish very well. She was only 20. So she picked the Spanish up really well and also did, you know, she always had an accent in English, but it was you know very gentle accent. Um, so she had five languages. My, my father tried to teach her Russian. Um, she did study Russian. She also tried to study Chinese. Um, my stepfather, uh, they planned a trip to China. So she tried to learn Mandarin before they went, but it was really hard because once they got there, of course, the dialects were different and she really couldn't understand much. So she loved language. She loved traveling. I loved, um, you know, the, to study other cultures and the arts on uh, music of other cultures. She just, she loved that. So yeah, they both were pretty good with other languages, Spanish, French, German, um, English. Russian, yeah. And how many of those have you picked up from them? Uh, only, well, English and German. I They spoke German together when I was little. So I picked up German first. And then when I went to school, they stopped speaking German because they wanted me to learn English. So I forgot the German. I learned the English. And then when I went to visit my grandparents when I was six, I had to be retaught the German. And I used it all summer, you know, so I, I have a pretty good grasp of German, so English and German. A little, I took a little French in, in, um, in uh, grad school, a little Spanish, but I, I can't really um, make myself understood with those languages, yeah. Yeah. So German and English. But the German came in very handy because, because all these letters were in German and um, my mother's handwriting was perfect. My father's was a huge mess. So it was really hard to get through his, his letters since they were very messy. But um, eventually I, I got the hang of his, you know, swoops and O's and loops. <laughs> I got, I think it's 99% uh, accurate. It took two years to go through all the letters and translate them. <clears throat> no, I think it's a real gift when uh, your parents can actually uh, provide you with a, you know, second language. Um, oh yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, so there's a question uh, from Karen. So 
was uh, uh, Habig or Gina. I don't know. Maybe I mispronounced that. Is Harbin. that a Haven? What Harbin. Is it? I think Harbin. it's Harbin or Harbin. I'm not sure how to say it. Harbin, China. A -R -B -I -N. Was it a haven for, for Jews? Uh, and she goes on to say, I had Jewish relatives from Russia that settled in uh, Habig for a while I mean, in the 1920s. Some went to Shanghai in the 1940s. Right. right. I think it was... Um, it was hard to get out of Russia, <laughs> very hard, but that you couldn't go west, you could go east. And at the beginning of the revolution, the borders weren't secured yet. So a lot of people left in 1919, 1920. But after that, when my father, by the time my father left, it was difficult. He had to get special permission to leave um, the USSR. So, but I think um, it was, he described it as being very um, exotic place with all kinds of different people, a lot of people selling different things. And I'm sure it was a haven because it wasn't under the communist control and people could travel from there to different places, which he did. Um, unfortunately, his brother, um, I know, I think his brother stayed there, but um, his sister Berta and her, his mother went back to Krasnoyarsk. Uh, his, Berta was married and had a child. And so she went back to her husband and um, my um, grandmother, was ill, but she wanted to stay with her husband. So she went back home and died shortly afterwards. Um, but his father survived another 10 years or so. And they were in touch with my father for uh, until 1933 when they lost touch. And um, then finally, you know, many, many, many years, 40 years later, they find uh, Joseph and Bert are still living and they discover my father's, um, they, they connect uh, because my father did a conference in Moscow and somehow Joseph found out and found my father through the Red Cross and my father went back in 1969 and visited them both in Leningrad um, oh, one, wow. once and they kept up letter writing until um, Joseph died in 1981 so that was quite amazing that they found each other again after 40 years do you have any of those letters they're all in Russian and I don't oh, okay <laughs> and handwritten Russian so no I I had some, I gave them to somebody who could translate them, but they said they were, they and translated a few, but they were kind of, um, you know, there were censors, so they didn't really talk about much of interest. It was sort of like, you know, the weather and very sort of trivial things. So I never really attempted to get them beyond just a few pages um, translated. Yes, I yeah. did have them. And I, I think I actually gave them to the person. I gave some to um, my cousin in Germany who, um, uh, the, the granddaughter of Berta, whom I met in 2005, I gave some to her and I gave someone to someone in this country who spoke uh, Russian, but the translation was not very interesting. So I didn't pursue that and yeah, I probably sure. won't. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, Karen also says, great presentation. What do you think was the reason for their divorce years later as they seem to have a happy life? Um, you know, earlier as a uh, early on. Yeah. Early well, on. I think I outlined some of the problems that they outlined um, towards the end of the relationship, her uh, insecurity and unable to an ability to take criticism very well. And his mostly his um, extreme uh, a not being able to understand her and to putting so much pressure, um, demanding so much. And for me, too, he was he was very difficult to live with because he had very strong opinions um, and was very hard to sway. <laughs> and really, um, you know, she could see, she could under, she was wonderful because she really could understand you. She met somebody for a few minutes and would understand how to deal with them. Whereas he didn't have any idea really. I mean, he was so self and self oriented that I think he just missed a lot of cues when the marriage was getting into trouble he just didn't react the way he should have and it was too late and um so they just got themselves in a big pickle and <laughs> it just didn't work out so but i think it, it was the right thing for because they both had happy second marriages um which was wonderful and i know my mother was much happier in the second marriage and i think my father uh, it was he, he didn't marry again for a few years maybe 13 years after the divorce but his second marriage was also very happy. So um, I think uh, that was, it was for the best. So. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah so uh, Katie asked, uh, what was your own childhood education from your parents, uh, particularly about around politics and religion, which obviously the letters mm -hmm. do touch on that a lot. Okay, so my father, uh, we attended church sp sporadically, not regularly. And my father was, 
non, he was, he described himself as agnostic and he didn't really, he, he admired some ministers and um, would go to discussions more than services. He didn't really like going to services. And my mother followed his cue. I think she was privately religious, but she didn't do it outwardly. And she didn't um, really tell me much about what she believed. I had to ask her close to the end of her life what she believed because she never told me. So I grew up in sort of, we celebrated Christmas, Easter a little bit, but it was nothing. So not a lot of um, emphasis on religion at all. A lot of on, on the arts, on music, on um, on history, uh, culture. Uh, my father was, you know, crazy for pianists. <laughs> piano. We went to a lot of piano recitals, and I. He forced me to take piano as a, a little girl, um, even though I wasn't really keen to do it. And, and but I did it, and I got to like it. <laughs> so, but I ended up with the harpsichord, which is more my thing, is is the earlier music. So, um, which was not his thing at all. He thought Bach was an exercise, <laughs> not me, not really music. So, um, so we were different in a lot of ways, um, but I hope that, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> I'll just, uh, uh, we finished the, the questions from the audience and I just okay. asked, um, so do you think that you got your love of music from your parents, particular, particularly your they, mother? They both love music. Oh, they both love music very, very much. Uh, and that comes through in the letters too. She gets very excited about Beethoven. Beethoven was his favorite composer. And she's just taken, just really taken away <laughs> by a lot of the uh, concerts. She goes to concerts. She talks about the the performers she hears. Um, so they both, um, they had a lot of beautiful records and would play them, you know, every weekend. I'd hear lots of good music. And um, so, yes, definitely. And I think um, my talent is probably mostly from my father. Um, he's, he, was a, he was a very good pianist. My mother played too, but more on an amateur level mm -hmm. and she loved to sing. So I would sing with her. So the singing was always a uh, second love and I ended up being a, a choral director. So that her influence uh, shows up that way. Anyway, so yeah, they both influenced me a lot musically. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think uh, um, we've covered a lot of ground, although there's more in the book. I encourage people to read it. And also the first book, uh, I, I've not read the first book, but I do plan to to get that and read it. Uh, it's very, the page turner, it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like it. So, uh, but listen, I, I want to thank all the people that uh, joined us. And I want to thank uh, Avera for the uh, very interesting talk and i think the you know two books that you put together the great uh, celebration of your your parents life and a great uh, way to uh, um you know remember them and um so uh, i don't know any any other uh, thoughts you have uh vera on uh, this, their stories no i think i i really um think i covered a lot of a lot of it um there's a lot more of course and um i hope uh it's as I said, the first book is a very, uh, as a page turner, I know people re read it in one day, you know, because it's so exciting uh, as we, um, he has so many close calls. Uh, he says he, he escapes death um, over 20 times in 20 years. So, whereas the letters book is one of a book that you would take more time with. Um, it's a very, can you kind of get, you get to know these people very slowly right. and gradually. Um, so it's not a book you're going to read in a week. It's it's going to be a little bit at a time. And but I think it's um, I think as you get to know them, it's it, it becomes more enticing and it gets more uh, interesting. And I I do say that that the last uh, few sections I wrote it right an afterward about my mother. I sort of synopsized some of her wise her wisdom, the incredible wisdom that she had on, in the appendix. And then some letters that were written about her, you know, by people she knew. And after her death, I collected um, some letters from her family and her friends about what kind of person she was. And um, so a good a good picture of my mother. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, a lot of wisdom in those letters. I agree. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, with you. that, I, yeah, I uh, thank you, uh, audience, and thank you, uh, Eric, for uh, for the great uh, presentation. And uh, thank you. And so, uh, and don't forget, uh, uh, folks, that uh, when we sign.